Good evening. I'm so glad that you've chosen to study God's Word with us tonight in this Wednesday night prayer meeting. If you would, open up your Bibles to the book of James, chapter 1. We've been studying through the book of James uh, for the last few weeks, and I hope you've been enjoying this study. Um, We are today going to be talking about um, descending upward. That sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? Well, it will uh, become more clear as the study goes along. But, uh, you know, uh, we see here in verse 9, I'd like you to read silently as I read out loud. Verse 9 of chapter 1 of James says this, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits." Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of this his word. You know, the Bible tells us that God opposes, in fact, we see this in chapter 4, verse 6 of the book of James, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God is somebody that works against pride, but he lifts up humility. In this world gone mad, we are taught to find our reward in possessions and position and power, and often God blesses us, blesses us with with possessions and position and even some power. But God says that our ultimate reward is found elsewhere, and it's important that we grasp it if we're going to live the Christian life well. In the Old Testament, the Bible records a time when Abram fought and won a battle against his relatives' enemies. And when it came to, came to divide the plunder, the king of Sodom said to Abram, keep the goods for yourself. But Abram refused, saying, I will accept nothing belonging to you so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. Now, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And when Abram had this vision, this is what God said to Abram. See, Abram, he refused the, uh, the plunder of the battle and said that he was essentially going to trust in God for his provision. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, that the Lord spoke to Abram after this and said, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield your very great reward. In other words, I am your reward. Better than positions, better than power, better than uh, uh, possessions, uh, I, your God, am your great reward. We are so tempted to look uh, for our treasure in things, in our human relationships, in our opportunities, in our health, but our true and eternal lasting treasure is only found in a relationship with Almighty God. He is our reward. God said to Abram, do not be afraid. I am your very great reward. God said, don't be afraid. If we're going to live fearless lives of faith in a world gone mad, we must find our reward in that, in that which no circumstance can ever take away. And no circumstance can ever take away your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross for your sins, rose again to be your Savior. If you've turned from your sin and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then my friend, nothing can take the most valuable treasure of your life away. Even death itself cannot take away the hope of eternal life, the confidence of eternal life that you have in Jesus Christ. This is profound. It is powerful. The only lasting treasure that makes one rich is the gospel that offers salvation from sin and eternal life in communion with God. James reminds us here that in life we face all matters of trial. We see that in verse 2. We studied that a few weeks ago. And in today's passage, he teaches that these trials serve as spiritual tests, tests to determine if we are focusing on our true spiritual reward. Now, I want to talk just for a moment about spiritual testing. And we're going to look at verses 9 through 11 of this passage that we read. It is through difficulties, losses, and temptations that we really discover what is important to people. 
Um, you know, if the elderly parents of a, of a family pass away, after the funeral, the siblings get together and divide up the possessions of the, fa- of, of the elderly parents? Will they squabble over the estate, revealing that they placed greater value on their parents and things than on their relationships with their siblings? Or will they be even-handed and fair and accepting? You know, when personal finances get tight and the temptation comes to cheat a customer, increasing the margin of profit, the person submits to the temptation, revealing a greater value that's put on profit over people or profit over principle. It's in the pressure cooker of life. It's when things are hard. It's when losses are great that our character is really tested. And you know what? There's two common tests mentioned by James in this passage. They don't necessarily enco- encapsulate all of the potential, um, potential tests or challenges or spiritual testing times that you can face in life, but there are two examples of them nonetheless mentioned by James. The first one is the test of poverty, the test of poverty. He talks about the brother in humble circumstances or low degree or lowly. Uh, this is, a, this is somebody who is uh, a part of the family of faith, a part of the church. Um, this is a Christian man, but is lowly. And by lowly, what, what is James referring to? It suggests one who is materially poor, maybe oppressed, humble, and from society's point of view, maybe even considered or viewed upon as unimportant in society. And the Bible says here that we're to take pride in, or that person who is of a lowly position is to take pride in or rejoice in, as the King James Version says, or as the New King James Verse says, glory in, in other words, boast in this humble circumstance. And the Bible even says that this person should do that because spiritually they are in a high position. Wow. High spiritual position that they have in Christ because they've been lowly in another area of their life. And it's not because that they're poor, but because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's essentially saying, let's take a look at it one more time, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. He's saying, hey, the the Christian that has little and does not have as much as others, that that believer should boast in their high position that they have in Jesus. That even though we may be of humble circumstance, we find that our greatest treasure is not in circumstance at all, but in our relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, if you have little, but you have Jesus, you have everything. If you have a lot, but you don't have Jesus, <laughs> you have nothing. In other words, we need to focus on our true reward in life. Don't get your mind riveted to the things you lack or the blessings others have. You, uh, you do that and in your mind you are poor and you have lost sight of the true reward of God, God himself in your life. So often it is those who are poor who are most consumed with fantasies of wealth. Um, That's why the gambling industry preys on this reality. That's why it is is something that I find so offensive that even our state or states around our country will prey upon the poor by um, partnering with gambling in order to to, uh, bring in revenue. Um, Many times people in low estate Uh, rivet their minds on their low estate, focus on that, and then pursue um, materialism. You could be poor and become a a greater materialist than a rich person. You see, the point here is not to say poor people are naturally more righteous. What is being said here is that if you are in low estate, consider it a test And in your heart and your mind, focus on the richness of your relationship with God and not on your low estate. It's all about our focus that is so 
important. The desire for wealth can consume your soul and take your eyes off Jesus, not just if you're rich, but also if you're poor. Um, so the Bible says, instead, the, the, the man in humble circumstances must remind himself, and more than that, he or she must take pride in or rejoice in the great and high position Christ has given them. They're forgiven. They're the children of God. They're in Christ and at the right hand of Father God. They have an eternal inheritance. They possess every spiritual blessing in Christ. John Adams writes, he has the features and feelings as well as the standing and the rights of a son. He is a new creature in Christ Jesus, a bearer of the divine image, a partaker of the divine nature. He has inexhaustible treasures of his, at his disposal, a provision adequate to every possible want and exigency of his condition, if not the actual possession of it, uh, at least a sure title to whatever can minister to his safety and happiness. He is the heir of a portion in comparison with which all the estates and dignities of earth are not worthy to be named. He is an inheritance in he he is an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away. Well may the poor man rejoice in his preeminence. Well may he lose sight of his own low degree, rise far above all its privations and humiliations, and exult in his being thus spiritually exalted. He, there is here a real solid ground of glorifying. It's basically saying when you lack something in life, but you're a believer in Jesus, you may lack it. It may be that God will even fill that need someday in your life, but this is a test. You go through a time of lack or a time of, uh, of low estate, then this is a test. Are you going to focus on your low estate and talk about how you don't have this and you don't have that? Or are you going to focus on your high estate, which is the fact that God has given you life in Jesus. He's given you forgiveness, an identity in his family. And that you're really richer than any rich man who doesn't have Jesus. How important it is to pass the test, this test of of the spiritual test, if you will, of uh, poverty. And then they also, too, uh, he talks here about the spiritual test of prosperity, because we can be tested by prosperity as well. You can have many things in your life and find yourself greatly tested by God. Uh, verses 10 through 11 speaks of this, says here, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away, for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Let me talk for a moment about the test of prosperity. And let me say for a moment that most of us hearing this message today, um, if anything, are in the midst of a test of prosperity. You may not you may argue with me on that point. You may say, uh, no, 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 I'm poor, or I don't have as much, or, and, and maybe that's true. I, I may not know your particular situation, but the fact is, is here in the West, the poorest among us would be rich in other places of the world. Many times, we have far more than any of our ancestors ever enjoyed um, in our day and age. Like I said, even the most poor among us in many ways are not as poverty, poverty stricken as many, many in the world. And so many of us are really suffering the test of prosperity. Now, how can prosperity be a test? Well, the fact is that God can test us with pain and he can test us equally with pleasure. Oftentimes it's prosperity that is the more challenging test. For it is prosperity that can blind us to spiritual reward that is much greater. There is not one material thing in your life, no matter how hard you worked to get your hands on it, that you will, not be, able to, that, that you will be able to take with you when you die. There's not one, one material thing that you're going to take with you when you die. Not one. And yet how deceived and drawn away from the Lord through the test of prosperity so many of us so many times are. 
In Mark chapter 4, verse 19, the Bible says, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires of other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. So many times our pursuit, our in, being enamored with the things of this world and the, the prosperity that we either have or want to have can blind us from the importance, the real importance of the truth of God's word and the gift of his salvation. John D. Rockefeller uh, was asked, how much money does it take to make one happy? To which he answered, just a little more. Verse 10 says, uh, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position. The rich man, like the poor man, is instructed not to find his great pleasure in the possessions of worldly goods, but to choose to find his pleasure in the same grace of God that the poor man was to seek and that the poor man was to exalt himself in. The rich man is to rejoice in that his riches are not his greatest treasure. His treasure is found in Jesus and eventually all his treasures will amount to nothing where it matters most and that is before God. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 17 through 19 says this, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Now, in comparison with the rest of the globe, like I said before, most of us would be characterized as rich. And we want to be able to pass the test of of prosperity in our life by not focusing on the prosperity, but focusing on our real prosperity, which is found in our relationship with Jesus. Always be focusing on Jesus. And now what I want to talk to you about is our spiritual reward. When we focus on our spiritual reward, we'll receive the experience of that spiritual reward. We see here in verse 12, the Bible says, blessed is, in other words, spiritually rewarded is the man who remains steadfast under trial, both the trial of poverty and the trial of prosperity. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Blessed, the man who perseveres under trial, it says, he'll receive the crown of life. You see, we receive uh, the, the bl spiritual blessings of life when we pass the test and we focus on our spiritual blessings. When we focus on that rather than on our lack or our luxury, we receive and experience the true treasure, which is just like Abram found, that God is our great almighty reward. How important that is. God wants to give you a reward, the greatest reward of all, a relationship with you. Let's value it more than material things, more than, than uh, positions and power and all the things that we pursue. Let's pass the test and treasure more than anything else our great God in our lives. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you that you have given us our great reward in a relationship with you through Jesus. Lord, may we place all of our value on that and may we live the rest of our week, our month, and all the years of our lives, dear Father God, pursuing you above all other things and recognizing you as our great reward. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a great evening, and I hope to see you Sunday.